Hey, oh, right, uh, Christmas horror story or spooky story. It's not really a ghost story. Yeah, I'll make that clear from the beginning. First of all, I'd like to say a big thank you to Sam at Moton Customs who's done all the additional artwork for me. I couldn't really have done that on my own. I'm not very good with that sort of thing. Also, as of today, Sam's opened up a special Christmas promotion. Um, 18% off any Motown product on the official UK website over the Christmas period. And you can access that discount via a discount code which I'll leave in the video description down below. Right, let's get on. Now, this is a true story that actually happened to me and I know sort of certainly since that incident that it also happened to other people. So, it wasn't just me. Now, um, this happened in the winter of 1984. And if my memory serves me correctly, it happened between Christmas and New Year 1984. Now, the 1980s were a very different era, um, <laughs> you know, to what we live in today. Our interactions with each other, you know, back then was, was much more honest than they are today. You know, political correctness didn't really exist. Workery certainly didn't exist. So... People only really self-censored uh, according to common sense. Read the room and you decide what's uh, appropriate and what's going too far. Now, I joined the Humberside Police in late 1983. I had Christmas off after leaving training school and I actually started at my first police station in January of 1984. And that was Tower Grange Police Station on Holdness Road in East Hull. Now, that first year, for me, it was a baptism of fire. I was relatively fresh out of higher education. The training course, you know, when I first joined the police, wasn't really any preparation for what I was going to experience. Now, for a start, the manners dispute sort of broke out in March of that year, just, a, you know, a few weeks, a few months into my service. All rest days were cancelled for a year and, you know, each shift in every police station had to supply so many police officers each day to help man the picket lines, which included me. Now, everyone was working at least 12-hour shifts instead of the regular 8-hour shifts. Sometimes you were having to work 16-hour shifts. So everybody within a few weeks was totally exhausted. And this went on for a year. Now, you know, during that time, I, I did my part um, on the manor's dispute, much to my dad's disgust, because, you know, obviously he comes from a long line of manors, and in his younger days was a manor himself. Caused a lot of friction at home, that. I was at Orgreave and Cresswell when it all kicked off. I mean, you know, the talk about the Battle of Orgreave, that's often sort of in the headlines, uh, or has been up until recently. Cresswell was actually much worse it was on a much bigger scale um and it was much more violent so anyway for that entire year you you were splitting your time between sort of living at proteus armor camp in uh, sherwood forest and working long hours back at division <laughs> As a young probationer, obviously, you had to learn your craft. You were on a two-year probationary period, during which time they could sack you at any time without explanation. And one of the things that they had to do, they had to get you used to death and tragedy. They had to desensitise you to it, because, you know, no Bobby is of any good to anybody if he falls apart in those sorts of situations. So, every sudden death that came along you were assigned to it and that situation would continue uh, for as long as you was there until a new probationer came onto the shift and then it would be his or her turn it was a necessary sort of conditioning process to get you up to spec so to speak so no matter what was thrown at you you could deal with it and you could keep a, a cool dispassionate calm head now, a sudden death can be anything from an industrial accident to, um, you know, just someone passing away at home through natural causes and everything in between. They're never a pleasant experience, sometimes they're downright messy. And once you attended at that incident, you effectively became coroner's officer. You were responsible for the custody 
of that corpse until it was safely deposited at the local mortuary and entered into the system. Now, even uh, a simple death by natural causes, you know, someone found at home by the postman or a neighbour or whatever, it could be a whole day's job because, first of all, you had to find out, you know, who the next of kin were and talk to them if possible. You had to get in touch with their doctor to see if there were some sort of underlying causes that he or she were aware of that would allow them to issue a death certificate. And, of course, you had to sort of look at the situation to assess whether uh, there was any foul play involved. Now, if a doctor was willing to um, issue a death certificate, all was good. This means that it could simply be handed over to uh, an appointed funeral director and they would sort of deal with everything from there because there would be no need for a post-mortem. But if the doctor declined to issue a death certificate because he wasn't sure of the course of death, then uh, it would have to go into the system at the local mortuary for a PM to be carried out. In my first year at Division, I think I dealt with about 12 of these. And as time goes on, you build up a sort of a, a, a callous, dispassionate disregard for these situation. It sounds wrong, but it was a necessary coping mechanism. So was humour. Now, the procedure was, if the doctor wouldn't issue a certificate, you would have to elect uh, a local funeral director because, you know, they had the facilities for transporting a body. We didn't. They would turn up, they would take the body away, and you would get to the mortuary ahead of them, and then you would receive the body ready for the booking-in process, which involved stripping the body of all its clothes and placing it in one of the retarders. Now, to me and you, I mean a fridge, but they call them retarders because the retard decomposition. Now, I suppose that if you arrived at the mortuary during normal working hours, the mortuary staff would probably assist you with this. But the truth is, because these were always long involved jobs, I never ever found myself in the situation where I was at the mortuary during normal working hours. It was always during the night. The mortuary, and in this case it was Spring Street Mortuary, um, it's gone now and uh, shopping centre's been put over the site, uh, St Stephen's Shopping Centre. As far as I can sort of work out by looking at maps, it was actually situated where the north west corner of the TK Maxx store currently sits, or at least somewhere very close to there. Now, you were always double crewed for this situation. Uh, usually you would get picked up, and uh, because, you know, basically it's difficult to strip a body alone. You would pick up the mortuary keys from your control room. Um, we only had the keys for the main entrance, but as far as I can remember, all um, funeral directors had a key to the rear door, so Quite often, when you arrived there, the body was always on a gurney uh, waiting for you to do what you needed to do. The funeral directors were usually long gone by the time you got there. Now, Spring Street Mortuary wasn't a particularly big building. It was a single-storey building, and I would say, looking at it, it was probably built in the early 1950s, something like that. From the outside, it was a sort of a generic council building, if you know what I mean. You wouldn't know what it was unless you knew what it was. There was no security staff or anything like that. You know, out of hours, it was locked up, it was unmanned, and it was in complete darkness. You would enter into a sort of a, a foyer area with various doors that went off to the left and the right. And then right at the bottom of this long rectangular room, there was another door. Now, certainly in my earlier days in the job, you would be accompanied by a more um, experienced officer, but they would tend to hang back and just let you get on with it. After all, you were there to learn you know, how to do the job. You would make your way to the back room, the storage area, room by room, switching the lights on as you went along. It was quite a sinister feeling place once you got inside, and eventually you would go through the autopsy room through some double doors and into the storage area where the retarder was. And usually that's where you would find the body that you were dealing with on a gurney 
waiting for you to do what you needed to do. Now, in the movies, um, these retarders are all separate little compartments, but certainly the one at Spring Street wasn't. It was like one big freezer room with just a series of large doors dividing up each compartment. Actually, when you looked inside, all it was was just a series of racks. Um, it was just one big void. And behind each door, there would be three separate racks. One low to the ground, one uh, about waist height, and one, I don't know, chest height. Each designed to receive a body on a gurney. Now, at one side of the room, there was a big sort of dry white notice board uh, where all the bodies were entered up. And of course, each door would have a number on it. Um, well, three numbers for each sort of receptacle area for the corpses you would find an unused number you would enter the deceased's details up on that board and then you know you would strip the body and place the body on that rack so that when the staff came on the next day uh, they would know who it was and obviously to facilitate that there was a little bit of paperwork to do as well you would then get the hell out of there just as fast as you could I mean, seriously, that place made my skin crawl. Now, I think I'd probably dealt with three or four sudden deaths, and um, you're starting to gain a bit of confidence. And when they realised that you were starting to get competent and confident with carrying out these tasks, there's a sort of a tradition on the shift that they would throw a wobbler at you. Now, this took a bit of organisation. Uh, as far as I'm aware, the supervision were aware of it, um, but turned a blind eye to it because it was character building, but they didn't get involved with it themselves. It will have been my fourth or fifth time doing this. Uh, early hours of the morning, went to the mortuary. Just me and one other Bobby, uh, one of the older guys on the shift. I was getting pretty efficient at this barn now. We quickly made our way through the building, turning the lights on as we went through. And sure enough, when we got to the storage area, which was also the sort of goods inward area, there was a corpse laying on a gurney waiting for me to deal with it. We got the paperwork filled out. We quickly got the body ready to go into the retarder put a sort of nylon shroud over it, as you were supposed to do, and then the guy that was with me went over to enter it up on the board. He shouted out the number of uh, space that was free to me while he entered it up on the board and told me to put the body into that sort of space. Now, that was fairly easy. You just sort of opened the door up, jacked up the gurney so that you could slide the sort of plate that the body was laid on into that rack. And the job was a good one. Only, when I opened the door, the rack that he'd allocated to me was already occupied. There was already a body in there. Now, I pointed this out to him and he said, right, now I've already entered it up. Obviously, somebody's had that body out. Put it back in the wrong place. So you're going to have to pull it out, put ours in there, and then we'll try and work out where that one should be. So I did as I was told. I got another gurney slid this body out onto the gurney, moved it out of the way, put my body in, and then just as I was about to close the door, the lights went out. I was plunged into total darkness. Now, I shouted across to him to see what he was playing at. No response. Just after the lights had gone out, I heard the doors to the PM room sort of slam shut, so I figured he'd left the room and something was going on. And not wanting to spend too long standing there in the dark in a mortuary, I started to fumble my way across the room to the door where the light switch was to turn the light on. Now, as I did so, I thought I heard a sort of a moan behind me. It wasn't really loud and in your face, but I definitely heard something. And, you know, I started to panic a little bit. I finally got to the door, fumbled around, found the light switch, quickly switched the lights on and then turned around to see where this moan had come from. And the scene that greeted me was the stuff of nightmares. There was another moan, a soft moan. And the unidentified body that had pushed over to one side was sat bolt upright on the gurney, gently swaying backwards and forwards. Now, 
I sort of knew that something was going on, but it didn't make it any less frightening. I, I was rooted to the spot. I couldn't move. I'd sort of got part of the way back across the room before I realised what was happening, and I was sort of in this no man's land in the middle of the storage area with this swaying, moaning corpse at one end, and the door leading to the PM room and escape out of this situation at the other end. So I decided to go towards the PM room. And as I turned to face those big swinging doors, everything sort of came together. There were several faces at the little porthole windows in the double doors, laughing at me, pointing at me, and I could hear clapping. With that, half the shift bursting to the room, sort of laughing at me and congratulating me for not losing it. And we were joined by the unidentified corpse, who, uh, as it turned out, was the last probationer to have joined the shift before I did. It was an experience that I will never forget. And as you can imagine, I was the butt of jokes at the centre of conversation for several weeks afterwards. But that's not the end of this story. It gets better. A few months later, we got a new probationer on the shift, which was found by me, because that meant that all the sudden deaths would now get fired at him. And I think he joined our shift sometime in October. Now, fast forward to that sort of quiet period between Christmas and New Year 1984. We were on nights, we worked a whole week of night shifts, and it was supposed to start at 11 at night and finish at 7 in the morning, but the manager dispute was still ongoing. And because of the staff shortages, we had to work at 7 at night until seven in the morning and this new lad who'd already you know had a few sudden deaths copped for another sudden death as soon as he came on duty at seven and i was given the heads up earlier on that tonight is the night and that's something i really didn't want to hear for the next few hours i listened to this lad's radio messages to sort of see what you know how far along through the process he was um it was getting close And then we got a call into the control room. Now, there were two local villains. There were brothers, uh, really nasty pieces of work, hardened criminals. I think they sort of fashioned themselves on the Cray twins, except they weren't twins, they were just brothers. Now, about a week before, one of them had died, and as was the family tradition, it was the day before his funeral, or a couple of days before his funeral, I can't remember exactly, and his body was being kept at the home address. You know, the family home. Now, these two brothers were inseparable, except when they weren't in prison, which they were in prison a lot. And the surviving brother, in drink, had gone along to the family home. Apparently, you know, he wasn't allowed in there. He didn't get on with the rest of the family. Yeah, it was a weird family. And he kidnapped his dead brother. Now... As it happened, he didn't get that far with his brother's body. Um, You know, the police were alerted and it was found not too far away on some waste ground. He realised he wasn't going to be able to carry it all the way home. The thing is, he lived in our area. Um, You know, the the crime took place in Bransholm, which was a different station. And we were East Hull. So, given a call from Bransholm to assist them with this guy's arrest because it it was found out that he'd gone back to his, I think it was his ex-wife's house to lie low and avoid the law. Now, this guy was a handful. He was an absolute monster. I'll, I'll Just to give you an idea, his wrists were so big, you couldn't get handcuffs on them. So they knew it was going to take a considerable number of bobbies to bring this guy down and get him into custody. And that suited me down to the ground. I would rather face him than go and be the body in the freezer. Now, we finally apprehended this guy, and he was a monster. I think it took six of us to bring him in and get him in a cell. It was just throwing us around like rag dolls. By the time we actually got him in and got him put in a cell, I was confident that I'd sort of dodged a bullet with this other scenario that was going on. But then, as I was walking up the cell block towards the charge room, somebody met me and said, Come on, we're off. He's going to be at the mortuary soon. We need to get there ahead of him. Bugger. (laughs) 
It didn't take us long to get to the mortuary. We let ourselves in and quickly made our way through the darkened building. Of course, being a 20-year-old young man eager to impress my colleagues, I was laughing and joking. I, I was all bravado, but inside, I was quietly dying with my inner monologue screaming in terror. At what was about to happen, I really, really didn't want to do it. This guy was rushing me. We didn't have much time and I didn't have time to think. We identified a vacant space in the retarda and I obligingly climbed onto a gurney and allowed myself to be covered over with a nylon shroud. And I remember thinking as he put it over me, God, I hope this has been washed since it was last used. I switched my radio off so that we didn't give the game away, but as I did so, a message came over the radio that the probationer was in attendance at the mortuary, so we were now out of time. It quickly slid me into the retarder and slammed the door shut. I started to tremble, not because I was frightened, honest, but because the previous activities had got hot and sweaty and, and I'd suddenly been shoved into a fridge. I mean, come on. It was pitch black. I couldn't see a thing. There was no way for me to get out because, funnily enough, they don't put door handles on the inside of the retarders. I don't suppose there's really a use for them. I could hear off to my right was the wearing of the circulation fans. And there was this sweet, sickly smell in the air from the industrial strength air freshener that they used to keep bad smells under control. As I laid there, occasionally I would hear the rustling of the, you know, shrouds off in the distance. I sort of rationalised that it was the fans or the moving air rattling the shrouds about. So I tried not to worry about it too much. And then... I thought that something brushed against the sleeve, the right hand sleeve of my tunic. I tried to ignore it, I thought, you know, it was just my nerves getting the better of me. But then suddenly, I heard a noise like someone clearing the throat. And then somewhere in the darkness, a cold, a freezing cold, clammy hand gripped my right wrist very firmly. I was frozen to the spot and I could hear someone breathing quite heavily over to my right. I didn't know what to do and then a deep, clear, baritone voice said It's fucking freezing in here, isn't it? I think it's safe to say that at that point I completely lost the plot. I started screaming to be let out of the retarder I was banging my feet on the door and flailing my arms around to sort of try and defend myself against this ghostly attack that I was expecting any second. Both the door to my retarder and the one to my right both opened simultaneously with, again, half the shift standing there and laughing at me. I looked over to my right and it was that same bloody probationer that had caught me out the first time. You see, it turned out that the new probationer was the son of a chief superintendent, and at the last minute, they decided they might not get away with it with him if he complained. So they decided to get me again. <laughs> Once again, thank you so much for taking the time to watch this video and for supporting this channel throughout 2023. I really do appreciate it. I hope you all have a great Christmas and a fantastic new year. I'm going to take a week, maybe two off now. So leave a like, make sure that you're subscribed and that your notifications are switched on and YouTube will let you know as soon as I'm back. If you're riding over the Christmas period, please ride safely, and I'll see you soon.